Hello, if you can hear me now. Yeah. Uh, welcome to this universe, to this planet, to this place. Uh, it feels natural to be here because we all decided to come this evening to Hakabe. It was your choice, it was your decision. Uh, we are not here by accident. Uh, perhaps we are not here by chance. Or are we? You could have chosen to be anywhere else this evening, but no, your will, your motivations, your intentions brought you to this place. But what if it was an accident? What if it was differently from what you think it happened? What if this universe was just a lucky draw from the hat and everything that this universe contains, including you, is just a very rare event in the endless number of probabilities? Perhaps um, this very particular grid, arranged grid in which we are in right now, it's stranger than we think. Also, I don't know, look just around you. You didn't select who you were going to sit with next to you, in front of you, as well as I didn't plan to be talking to you right now in this moment. So it might be stranger than we think. Randomness surrounds us. It's been following us throughout our existence, and it's embracing us right now. So for a moment, um, I want you to think that randomness is here. And also, let's not forget that randomness also teaches us that events like this evening are also very likely to happen. So, well, good evening. Uh, my name is Naum, um, and I'm here to tell you a couple of things and to do something with you as well. Um, so first thing is I have here with me um, a very particular book. It's called A Million, a Million Random Digits with 100,000 Normal Deviates. This particular book um, was published in 1955, but its production started before, in 1947. It was uh, quite an achievement to make this book. Um, this book contains just a series of random numbers. For example, spoiler alert, <laughs> 8131, 10878, 15433, and some other unpredictable numbers. Um, the way they yeah. The way they produced this, this book um, was like they created a sort of um, electronic uh, uh, roulette wheel attached to a computer, and it was running. After they, they got the million random digits, they were filtered and tested to prove the, the real random nature, and they are all here in this book. Um, also, I mean, this book was something uh, very useful back in the day. Uh, it was the first source of truly random digits. And these numbers are apparently very useful for modeling complex systems such as climates and economics that require uh, endless numbers of variables. So having this book with me makes me wonder how random is random. So we're going to do something. As Giuseppe just said, we're going to create an interface between the nature, the universe, and our understanding. So I want you to be very alert and aware. I'm going to throw these things randomly. And you have to catch them. Come on. <laughs> that was not quick. OK, that's better. There we go. There we go. 
OK, so stand up if you have one of the balls. Let's throw that again. OK, uh, stand up. So we have one, two, and what's the other one? Where, 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 where? OK, good. So two and three. So well, you, you, you might think that I'm very good at throwing balls and that I have actually thrown them to exactly the points where I wanted them. So let's generate more randomness here. People with the balls, please throw it to a random member of the audience, please. When I count to three, one, two, three. <laughs> OK, so we have three people. Stand up now. Come on, you have to find it. OK, and this is not very random, but OK, let's, um, <laughs> let's do it one more time, please. So to a random member of the audience when I count to three. One, two, three, three. OK, you, you've got one. Stand up, please. Anywhere else? Or are they gone? OK, two. And we're missing one. OK, three. OK. So three of. The, the three of you, I want you to remain standing, please. And don't just stay like that. And in the meantime, I also want to tell you something else. Um, uh, there's this text about this particular book by George Burson, who was unable to join us tonight. It's titled uh, a million random digits, November 2017. The forest around Pemberton is among the last places in the world where you can find that kind of late seral canopy. At the time, there was little light pollution, or at least that is how I remember it. The sky was full of stars, all of them unfamiliar for I had been in Southern Hemisphere all of the 10 days. The second thing that has stayed with me was the scent of the wood smoke. I could not describe for you any of the constellations that I saw that morning. So, the three of you, uh, please follow me. You can go. Around the stage. We're going to the stage now. Two. We know remarkably little about the origins of controlled anthropogenic combustion. Or rather, what we know is probably wrong. So despite uh, extravagant claims for controlled use of fire, at 1.6 million years ago, secure evidence that humans were using fire on purpose appears only after 400,000 years ago, which is still something. Think of the different ways humans have used fire. There is the use of fire to enhance the living environment for warmth, light, or as a smudge against insects. So, um, perfect. And there's something with you. You can put the bolts on the on the floor, please. I want you to, yeah. Let's start with you. This book has 400 pages. Think of any page. 144. 144. I want you to open the book on page 144. 
Yeah? I want you to rip it, to tear it apart. Yeah, remove it. Destroy it. Yeah, remove it from the book. Yes. As you do it, yeah, it feels bad. But no, 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 no. Just shh, rip it. Exactly. Okay, perfect. Now give that page. What's your name? Michelis. 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 Give that page to Michelis. Okay. Michelis, I want you to tear that sheet in five. So one. You put it together, two, and so on. It's one. It's two. That's three. Okay, yeah. Okay, super. And then take two halves, in one in each hand, and drop to the floor anyone, just one and you keep one in your hand. You decide. Great. And now you're going to give... Uh, okay. Oh. okay, that's cool. So, follow me. So, uh, choose a number between one and ten. Okay. Hmm? Tell, tell it to me. Six. Okay. So I'm going to remove six pieces, right? That's one, two, three, four, five, and take the sixth piece for yourself, okay? Okay. What I want you to do now is to look at the first full five-digit number that appears there mm -hmm. and write it down here. Where I cannot see you, please. Oh, yeah, see the first full five-digit number. But you can never know when you set the world on fire exactly how the fire will spread, how far, how fast, in which direction, or how hot it will burn. What makes fire such a powerful emblem of mastery of order is the fact that it intrinsically is aleatory. Fire is palpably random in a way other basic features of the material world are not. You said six, right? Yep. So. One, two, three, that was close, huh? <laughs> Five, and last one. Combustion is also the destruction of order. But also, combustion is the generator of all random numbers that humans have devised.
Can we see your number? Two, one, two, one, seven. Perhaps. Yeah, perhaps we are not here by chance, and perhaps today, 2nd of December 2017, is more than a random situation. Thank you. Thanks. Follow that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty random, right? <laughs> So, um, so we're going to have a conversation. I like the phrase I heard earlier uh, this evening, which is a commitment to um, uh, improvisation. So it's a sort of conversation without a tightrope, right? With, yeah. uh, so we'll just see where we go. Um, so what I'm interested in really is these attitudes to, to chance and randomness that were sort of captured in that uh, performance, but also in scientific practice and, and outside scientific practice. So, Helena, maybe we could start with the synthetic biology that you are involved in yeah. and the, the kind of way that chance shows up uh, in various ways. Yeah, so working with biological materials is uh, really beautiful and really messy because um, our material and the subject of study is intrinsically um, subjective variation, and there's a lot of random processes happening, uh, whether it's in our bodies, in our cells, and in, at the level of populations as well. Um, if you take the example of a simple cell, you could say that it's just a, a bunch of molecules moving around randomly and encountering each other and interacting with each other. And at the same time, uh, it's really interesting to think how all this Brownian motion uh, from that emerges uh, complex structures and um, functions uh, that seem so perfectly designed. Um, and so biology, uh, yeah, it's uh, full with variation. And so it took us a while to understand how this very complex system works and make sense out of them, right? And so thanks to things like computational modeling, we could find uh, stable uh, patterns that are there that are sort of like deterministic, right? That you can write an equation to say, um, when you make these uh, things interact with each other, you get this output. And so the system rationale uh, really try to give this uh, mathematical description of nature. And in, in some ways, uh, it was pretty successful because indeed we can uh, use the mathematics and modeling, we can uh, describe how uh, networks of molecules inside a cell can interact. And so we got really excited and then, uh, well, if you understand how a network works, how uh, these things interact with each other and the feedbacks, then in theory you can also direct uh, the system towards a specific direction that you want. And that's how, like, a little bit the synthetic biology feel uh, was born, which is that you will provoke things artificially inside cells to make a specific end. And so, well, that is very beautiful, but it's not true. <laughs> uh, what happens is that most of the time, so indeed we can provoke the system um, to go towards a specific direction, but biological systems are in constant motion, they are dynamic, and so at some point uh, they, they escape our control. Um, and so that's what frustrates a lot of physicists and a lot of mathematicians and computer scientists that got interested in biology. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, it makes us realize how actually contextual those uh, and dynamic these systems are, and so maybe we need to uh, understand that they are in constant motion and that, uh, yeah, so contingency is there. <laughs> so there's a, t a, a tension right there between a kind of engineering control yeah. um, ambition, that the lab has to be a place where, we're, where we extinguish variation and randomness so that we have some security in the results that we're getting, tensioned against a sense that randomness, mutation, 
Stochasticity yeah. is maybe the source of some of the interesting order in those systems, and, yeah. and so we want to have both worlds. Yeah. Um, and to me, watching the performance, I think a lot of the a lot of the um, intrigue of that performance is on the same tension, right, between the fact that there's randomness uh, and the, therefore jeopardy, it might go wrong, but there's also a sense that, them, that the whole thing revolves around the fact that it won't go wrong, that there is control some, exactly. somehow. Exactly, and um, yeah, it, it could have gone wrong, and then <laughs> I would be very embarrassed. Uh, but we'd be having a different conversation. We'll be having, yeah, very different <laughs> conversation. Yeah, um, well, there was a plan B for a different ending. But, but, but again, again, this is about how, how we want to control situations. And, and, and yeah. you're talking about how uh, computer scientists feel very fr frustrated. And, yeah. and, 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 and I think it just, I mean, what, what, I, what I was very interest, interested in doing this little experiment was to, well, first, Problematize uh, uh, randomness mm -hmm. in 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 the in the perspective of experience. Um, we, I think, we we as human beings, uh, the, our human condition is is terribly terribly bad at accepting random events. That's why we uh, see patterns. That's why we see uh, relationship, very complex relationships. Um, Etc. I think we cannot cope with that. Uh, we can accept randomness, perhaps in, in certain events. Uh, we're talking just about if I throw coins to the floor, we are okay with the fact that the coins are going to be distributed unevenly in random ways. Some will be up, some down, etc. But when it comes to the, uh, to, I don't know, to a tragedy where 100 people die, we don't accept it as well. It thinks happened, it was a bad day. We want to, we want to find the reasons yeah. why, why is that happening? So again, there, there's, there's a tension between that and how we control sometimes the, the, the outcomes, and that's what uh, divination, uh, prediction practices, mm -hmm. there are so many with ashes and fire. Um, that's what they do, uh, trying to be in control of the process, of, of the, the outcome. Yeah. The fate yeah. to give us, I don't know, uh, 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 calm, calmness. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that's uh, part of the reason why the book of a million rad random digits is amusing is, this, is the hubris of attempting to capture randomness and pin it down in a book. Yeah. And um, that book is a, it's a real book, and you can buy it on Amazon, and it's one of a a small number of things that are sold on Amazon that are yeah. famous because of the reviews that are written of them. And there's a series of extremely funny reviews of this book. The best reviews, you have to read them. <laughs> the, the, and the, the humor turns on, on that hubris and on the, the inappropriateness of using a book as a vehicle for randomness. Mm -hmm. So there are jokes like, uh, that tell you who did it at the end, right? So you don't have to read the book because they tell you the last digit. It turns out it was number nine. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and other jokes about the fact that there are errors and someone points out that on this yeah. page, a seven should really yeah. be a three. And uh, better than the film. Uh, <laughs> and, but, but I think they, they reveal something that's quite a sort of um, a deep appreciation there about, about randomness and sort of the, the very fact that people can make that, those jokes is revealing something about our attitude to, to randomness and stochasticity, um, which I think is really interesting. So there's a, there are, the reason why Rand Corporation invested so much money in that is that we're very bad at generating random numbers ourselves. And an exercise that I uh, have done with um, undergraduates is I can get them to write a little computer program that simulates a neural network, a little learning algorithm, and it's only got maybe three nodes, a tiny, simple neural network. And I get them to play against that neural network. They play uh, scissors, paper, stone. I don't know whether you know that game, right? Where the best strategy is to behave randomly, right? You play scissors, and uh, you don't want to give a cue, right, that you're going to play scissors, because then your opponent can play the appropriate response. And what people find is that the neural network will gradually get better than them at playing that game, because it will pick up on the fact that people are not very good at generating a random series of scissors, paper, stone. They tend to not generate the same move uh, many times in a row, right? So 
scissors, scissors, scissors feels an extremely unlikely thing to play, and people don't play it enough. So that's, there's a bias in people that they're yeah. not, we're not very good at sort of um, at understanding what randomness really looks like, and we're not very good at generating yeah. it. Yeah. Um, which I think maybe some some magic performances kind of maybe rely on that, right? <laughs> uh, that you can uh, you can take advantage of that bias, uh, and certainly casinos take advantage of that bias, right? So the gambler's fallacy. Uh, yeah. It's come up red. I've lost on red three times in a row, I, surely, what are the chances that I can lose again uh, the fourth time? The uh, well, it, it's the same yeah. chance as before, but it doesn't feel like that to the gambler, uh, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> so the, do you think that science, the, the synthetic biology uh, that you do, is ready to, to fully embrace that kind of uh, spontaneous randomness, or because it's an engineering field, is, yeah. it, is it always going to want to hold it at arm's length? Well, we like to say that it's an engineering field to feel in control, but I think it's more like experimenting uh, with the system and then somehow we get lucky and then <laughs> we finally <laughs> find what we want. But, but in science, uh, there, there is usefulness to uh, kind of like accepting this uh, randomness and stochastic uh, events. Uh, for example, if, you, if you're talking about uh, computational biology, indeed, uh, including a random factor in your model mathematically sometimes matches more with reality. So instead of being super deterministic, then you accept that there are random, randomness behind it, and then you get something that looks more like the real picture. Uh, and so that's more from the theoretical side, more from the practical side, well, um, Actually, like, uh, so I'm a biologist, so I, I work with bacteria, et cetera. And so sometimes you want to go from a point A to a point B. So the engineering logic is like, I want to get to point B. Uh, and so we're not that good at it sometimes because we, we can guide ourselves things to models, but then we do whatever we think uh, is going to make us go to point B, and then it doesn't work. Um, and so. What we do is that, well, we just uh, basically uh, imitate nature, which is uh, we, nature generates randomness and generates variability. And so what we do is either we increase the probability space, so we just imitate nature by generating randomness as well. Uh, if I can give a very simple example, um, uh, so imagine that you have a... In my case, like I work with peptides, which is just like uh, amino acid sequences, and then we saw that if you change these three amino acids in this region, then the activity of this peptide will change. Either it will be more efficient or less efficient. And so we want to get to a more efficient point, and so we have no idea how to get there. So what we do is like we randomize these three peptides. And so by doing so, we create a lot of variability, and then as engineers, we make tools to try to find that specific variant. So we're going more high throughput in, in biology, and by going more th high throughput, we in increase the probability space. Um, so one of the things that that yeah. relies on is our ability to know it when we see it. So we're, yeah. we're the, the generative part of the creative process is being randomized, but the the filtering and the selective part, yeah. uh, it's like we... we is what we, we that's decide. That's the one we want, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, you mentioned divination. That, that it seems like, to me, there must be something similar there, that we, we throw yarrow sticks down or we toss coins to determine uh, which page of the I Ching we're going to read. Um, and it could be... There's only a small number, really. I mean, yeah. uh, it's not to, to capture the entirety of all the questions that humankind might ask, a small book has got a, you know, a number of pages and we find a random page. But the, way, the, the way that it works is that we spot something in that, the passages that we read, so really we had the kind of answer in ourselves, the, I think is yeah. the idea. Yeah, exactly. And who's to blame in that case, gravity? <laughs> yes, well, when we toss the, the yarrow, no one is to blame. I mean, maybe that's also a useful thing, right? Exactly. I mean, that, 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 that's human nature uh, replying. We can make a decision. Who, I can, who, I... Ultimately, who's, who's in control? Yeah. And, and I mean, like, I, and again, what, what I mentioned before is like, what if we live in a very random universe? And this very random We live in indeed. a very random universe. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting because the, the first um, 
uh, discussion in this session, uh, there was a claim that we don't actually live in a random universe, that really we live in a universe where everything that happens, there is a reason. It's just that many of those reasons we don't sufficiently care about to dig down and find them. Um, mm. And so when a company makes a new drug, they might test it on a random sample of the population and they might pick random numbers from the special book in order to make sure that it's a proper random sample of the population. But that's only because they can't afford to test it on everybody carefully. And it's because they don't care about the difference between you and me. They just care about on average that it would be okay for us. Um, and you could imagine if the police said that that's the way they were going to approach solving really serious crimes, <laughs> that they were just going to knock on random doors until they found something uh, yeah. that worked, we'd tell them that that's not right, right? They have yeah. to care more than that. They have, they have to behave like detectives and piece together a story. But drug companies don't have to behave like detectives and piece together a story for each drug. They're allowed to be indiscriminate and random. Or, well, it's a defensible randomness, yeah. right? But it's still... Uh, averaging over us and there's I think again in this the response to this million random digits book there is a sense that that the randomness is a is a is a source of inhumanity right it's a way to yeah. to average over us uh, blend us together um, and that certainly since 1948 has been a, a trend in the in the adoption of uh, mathematical and physics ideas in the social sciences um, possibly uh, okay, where to next <laughs> in this conversation? Um, one of the things that, it occur that occurred to me, there's a nice experiment that economists do called the ultimatum game, where two people play a game and they uh, can either play as player one or player two, like a video game. Uh, and you choose it at random. So you pick two people, they don't know each other, they're random people in the ideal version of the game and one of them gets to be player one, maybe you toss a coin. And the game is very simple. You put 100 pounds or 100 euros uh, on the table, and the player one offers some of them to player two, and player two gets to decide whether to keep them. It sounds like a trick game, right? So player one might offer 60 uh, or might offer 10, and player two gets to decide whether they want th that money. But if they say no, the money is destroyed. If they say yes, they take the portion that was offered and the remainder goes to player one. So it's a game about fairness uh, and generosity. And in the normal version of the game, when the two players are picked at random, uh, if I'm player two and someone only, only offers me one euro, then maybe I'll just make all the money burn, yeah. right? That's mm -hmm. a rude thing to do to me. Why should he get 99 and I get one? But if instead of doing it at random, you decide who gets to be player one based on a game of skill. So first of all, you play some game. Then actually I'm prepared to accept a much lower offer on average when people run these experiments because I, because I judge that there's a reason why. Yeah, uh, because you're biased, right? And then... But that random, it means that we have an attitude to randomness which is, that, um, which is implicit in that result, right? That, the, that fairness and randomness have a relationship to each other, which is... Um, I guess we always try to find like relationships because like uh, we like to like we were saying control our fate right we like to find the cause of a specific effect yeah. because if we don't like the effect then by removing the cause then it's not going to happen and so yeah. we we sort of like uh, reduce the chance that it will happen and if we like the effect then we will like push it. Uh, make that happen uh, increase our chance for that to happen right. So and that's I, so sorry. No, no, no. I just want to add something uh, that actually is the reason why I'm here. In one of the early conversations I had with Sasha uh, Polep uh, when he was curating uh, this, this section, um, is I mentioned that uh, one of the greatest magicians, David Berglas, uh, an English magician, he had a uh, he came up with this magic trick, which is like the holy grail of performance magic, called any card, any number. Uh, which is basically someone says any, any, a number within the deck of cards and somebody else says uh, a, a, a type of card. So when you count the number of cards that someone said, the resulting card will be the card that the other person said. So uh, for, for people that know magic, they know that 
it's impossible to do that with, without slate of hand. And, and, and he did it without slate of hand. He, um, and later on, one of his uh, students wrote a book about how this magic trick works. And the result is a 500 page uh, explaining not the trick, because it's an impossible trick after all, but it's more about exactly how, how identifying opportunities or accidents yeah. and framing them as what you actually wanted to show, but actually things just happen and Provoking things just happen all the time. Uh, for it to happen. Exactly. So it's, it's all about how you present it in your, in your, in this case, in your, in your benefit. So, so for in, me, sorry. It's not, yeah, in science, we also do that, right? I mean, uh, we also try to increase our chances of success. And uh, in our practice, well, it has a beautiful name called serendipity, right? That, uh, that is like a, a fruitful encounter that is almost random, that voila, the, the key of Rekha. And so uh, it's a beautiful uh, way also to do science. Uh, so, so most of the time, people think that uh, science is a very, uh, whether it's biology or anything else, uh, it's very directed, very, uh, very linear in practice when actually we're just like playing around with stuff uh, and mm -hmm. then sort of like uh, by learning uh, in, in the way we try to increase our chance of succeeding uh, and we choose different directions until it is there and then... So it starts off superstitious. We have to do the yeah. experiment in this lab. Yeah, in Japan, yeah. So they, in, the in biology, there's a lot of black magic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like also, like my students, they're like, "Oh, you did this PCR and it works." And like we've been trying, I'm like, eh, magic, uh, magic hands. But like, yeah. or you yeah. have to use the right pipette, right? <laughs> yeah. And the so once, pipette, once yeah. we find something that works, sometimes we don't even know why, but we know it, it will work, and we just transmit that practical knowledge. Uh, but there's a strong survivor effect. So because there's a strong survivor effect. The, yeah. We live now in a world where uh, you know, something extremely rare can happen, something trivial but rare, and suddenly it's all over yeah. the internet. So kids flipping bottles and the bottle <laughs> lands. Yeah. But you don't see the thousand that were flipped didn't work. You yeah. just, YouTube just shows you the one that succeeded. Yeah. So we have a generation of kids growing up in a world where these things are possible, right? Yeah. Whereas... It's the same in science. Yeah. I mean, you read the scientific paper and you're like, oh yeah. my God, this person is amazingly smart. Well, actually, yeah, you, they don't show the millions of PhD students that, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that were behind yeah, yeah, yeah. trying all kinds yeah. of stuff. It's like when you watch the wrong videos of kids yeah. playing with a knife and the hands, no? Like, yeah. They go awfully wrong. Well, so, the, I, so there's a, that risk-taking, so chance and risk-taking accidents... Um, the sort, this sort of negative connotations of chance and the, the propensity to take risks. Teenage men in particular, uh, in every culture, there's this massive peak of deaths by accident around uh, the mid-teenage to late teenage years just because we're, our brains are not set up to, to protect us from those uh, risks when we're going through some critical uh, teenage period. And... That's really well understood, uh, but presumably there are other weird risk-taking biases that, are, uh, that take place in the, in the 50s when politicians are making decisions about the future of the countries that they run. So the, the fact that they're not drawing random numbers from a book of carefully balanced, <laughs> perfectly rational random numbers, they're just relying on the risk-taking devices that evolution gave us seems very... Uh, scary, um, and we're not, so there are many, many science labs across the world all trying to do the same things, but we only yeah. have, we have a much smaller number of countries and planets trying to do the same, trying to do reasonable things. We can't afford that kind of parallelism to be the way that we yeah. solve these problems. Um, so the, this attitude to chance of positives associated yeah. with it, that it's about a source of creativity, and kind of uh, sparks and, and sort of wondrous uh, breakthroughs uh, and new, t new techniques, you know, new equipment being used in uh, random yeah, source ways. source of variability, right? And then uh, the more diversity you have, whether it's in, uh, in, 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 in the biological population or whether it's in the creative process, uh, generating variability always comes with the generation of novelty. Of, mm -hmm. uh, but the negative is you don't want to be the... The, the hopeful monster that is 
terrible, right? Yeah. I don't want to be the mutant <laughs> that has the bad mutation. So the universities yeah. that I've worked at often think that interdisciplinarity is a fantastic thing, but when you talk to individual academics, they would all rather someone else did it, right? Because it's hard. They yeah. want to carry on just being a physicist. They think interdisciplinarity is great, but uh, they'd rather export that to somebody else's job. And there's something similar. Variability and randomness and exploration is fantastic, but 99 out of 100 uh, <laughs> don't, of those probably not, uh, yeah, don't <laughs> make it, don't work, uh, which is fine in a, in a lab of little test tubes. Yeah. We don't really care so much about the 99 test tubes, but when that spills over into, uh, into, into politics, into economics, then uh, things or, are... Or to health, difficult. things like cancer and things like this that are... Uh, that emerge uh, randomly, right? That, that we can't control and, and that when it happens to us, it's like we don't want to be that mutation uh, or that, yeah. that it happens, yeah. Okay, I think we are being <laughs> drawn to a close and we can hand over to the next speaker. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>